Welcome to this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. This week's Eccentric Minute is one of my favorite exercises to do with the K-Pulley, and that is the pull-through. Guys, once you've figured out about how far you need to walk out with the K-Pulley, grab whatever attachment you're using for the pulley, walk yourself out there, and really push your hips back at the K-Pulley. From there, when you hit that stretch, really punch your hips forward, keep your chest up, and try to extend your knees and your hips all the way through. And this is where one of the major benefits of using a flywheel kicks in, as it pulls you into a deeper stretch as you push your hips back in, into your hamstrings and your hip extensors, so that you really open it up and stretch everything out in the back. This is an exercise that I'm sure your athletes are going to love to hate, but reap awesome rewards from. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over a hundred different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASP today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash CVASPS to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely killer talk. We are joined by Joel Reinhardt to discuss the role of the return to play process he has implemented with an athlete post Achilles repair. Uh, you know, guys, after a real quick rundown of how we got up to Amherst, he is going to dive right into the process of how they evaluated the past year of working with this student athlete. This is gonna include everything from the principles that he's utilized with this progression to some of the actual steps and the checkpoints that they had. This is a really awesome overview and a 15,000 foot view of the last 10 months and how that they've brought this athlete back really from ground zero all the way back to return to play. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get right to it. All right, man, and here we go. Joel, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Thanks, man. Yeah, man, yeah. I'm fired up for this one. It's uh, we were talking a little bit off camera about, you know, what you've been doing and and what you, what this like specific project we want to talk about today. But you know, before we get too far into it, you know, who is Joel and, and how'd you get up to Amherst? Yeah, so I'm uh, Joel Reinhardt. Um, I'm up here with Amherst, uh, UMass Amherst football. Um, Let's see, i be quick. I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota, right outside uh, Twin Cities, and then went to undergrad at St. Olaf College, small little D3 school right outside Minnesota, uh, right outside the, the cities, and played football there. And then I went straight from there to Springfield College in Massachusetts. I uh, did two years there, master's in GA. Um, and then from there, finished my master's, went down to Nickel State in Thibodeau, Louisiana. I was down there uh, for two two football seasons, one off season, so like a year and a half, basically, um, working with football and then a couple other sports. And then basically a year ago now, in January, um, Coach Bell got hired here um, as the head football coach and then Coach Deed uh, as director of sports performance. And got the call and so now I'm up here as assistant director of sports performance for University of Massachusetts and I have um work predominantly with football but then I also train the uh, the women's lacrosse team as well and while you're up there you've kind of inherited let's say an interesting project yes yeah yeah, yeah. so we um we have a, a post-op um Achilles uh, that I've been working with for, I mean, the entire time post-op, but 
basically from the four month point on, I've pretty much exclusively um, taken all his rehabilitation uh, with, our, with our athletic trainers, helping out in terms of some, you know, just restorative work and um, some modalities along the way. But the brunt of the active rehabilitation I've taken. Um, and like we were talking about off air, like I've just, as we got to a certain point, I was like, all right, what are these, what are some of the overarching principles that I've been looking at and just using without even really thinking about it? Um, but I think we've had a lot of success and he's progressed very well. Um, and then just kind of looking back at it and saying, all right, what was I kind of going off of? Like, why did I make the decisions that I made? Um, obviously in the moment I was using principles that I had worked off before, um, but then even looking back again and saying, okay, in the moment tweaks that I made, like why did we make those tweaks um, and how did they go and kind of where did they come from and even things that I omitted, like why did omitting them go well? Um, so yeah, yeah, I guess like starting at the end and working back, a couple weeks ago we he reached the, the milestone of he can full speed sprint, jump, cut, basically all high intensity on field movement. Um, we reached that milestone at exactly seven months post-op Achilles. Um, and we're, we're pretty excited about that. I mean, obviously we're not out of the woods yet. He's still got, got a ways to go. Um, we haven't introduced any sort of contact yet. Um, but that milestone, when we reached that, it was right towards the end of the football season. i have been working with him on the side at practice and progressing and, um, I made sure on one of our flights to one of our last games, I just sat down and like, all right, to all the just kind of brain dumped about like, what have we been doing? What did I omit? Where did I start? Um, and just went from there. Um, and so we, um, and working with Shadid and kind of like, okay, where did we start? And then I was, like I said, kind of brainstorming some of this with Nick DeMarco as well, um, who I, both him and Shadid lean on a lot um, in terms of just, brainstorm and, and then um yeah so we i guess some some bigger principles that i was looking at was like okay in rehabilitation i see a lot where you're you're injured and it's like okay we need to get back to healthy um but i think number one that i did and like the sports performance background obviously helps coming into a rehabilitation setting because I, number one thing I started with, whether it was a healthy individual, hurt individual, post-op, minor injury, whatever it is, is what is the end goal that we're trying to get back to? And with this being a football skill position player, it was, you know, obviously playing football, but then looking back one derivative from that, it's full speed, sprinting, jumping, cutting, basically the ability to, in with no restrictions, perform high intensity on field work. And, okay, basically, where are we are right now? What do we need to do to get there? And so when he got past the, you know, we got at the basically four-month mark, we were cleared for low-level ground contact, um, which we then, so basically that was day one of fall camp. Uh, was August 1st. And so I got him basically every single day and with it being extensive enough type of work, we basically like every day we started with a ton of foot isometrics. This guy in particular had um, just super weak feet. Some of it was even pre injury and then just the like well, being off your feet and all that of having an Achilles, like just lost a ton of that with um, both sides too. So we attacked, the foot isometrics and um, just low level ground contacts, trying to develop some of that stiffness um, up until the point where, you know, he was basically, we started supported where he's barely even leaving the ground. I guess I should, this is the point where I should shout out your previous podcast with um, Boo, where he talks about doing similar stuff with an ACL. Cause I basically just took that same progression and applied it to an Achilles. Um, and, we started with you know, supported pogos, and then when that started looking good, and a lot of this was subjective as well, it's like, what does look good mean? 
um, was just like me being able to watch every single ground contact that he incurred um, for months and months and months and months. I was able to just have a good eye of like what his normal ground contacts look like and then seeing, okay, we're progressing, we're looking better, we're interacting with the ground better. Um, so we just started with extensive plyometrics and progressed up from there. Like I didn't, didn't necessarily worry about like, Oh, what's his calf girth look like? Like some of those things. It was just like, all right, the end goal is high intensity on field movement. What is my biggest impediment to that? And it was stiffness. It was through the whole ankle, foot ankle complex, but also just like stiffness in general, whole lower body because he hadn't done any sort of high intensity movement in quite some time. Um, so just from like a graft and injury site standpoint, you know, he was at that point where you're quote unquote healthy, like kind of out of the woods of, you know, if you looked at an MRI, his MRI of his ankle, of his Achilles would look very similar, if not no different from just a healthy individual who hadn't performed any ground contact in four months. So that's basically, okay, where do we want to be? How do we get there? Um, so we started with the low level extensive plyos and just started building up from there. Um, but then I think the point where we kind of, that was just kind of basic, like common sense, I guess. Um, but then the point where we started digressing a little bit, which took some trust from the kid as well, was when we got the medical clearance to start running. Um, basically, it was about a month later. So about September 1st, around our first game, we got the medical clearance to start running. Um, which for me, I was like, well, we had been doing a bunch of ground contacts from the extensive plyometrics. So I was like, we're probably incurring similar forces anyway. Um, but um, we went out and this is where I was like, this is the aha moment for me where I was like, I'm an idiot. Is we we're like, all right, we're going to start, you know, still pretty on the extensive end of the spectrum and then work up from there. And so I was like, all right, let's see, you know, he understood in his brain extensive tempo and just kind of what that pace and shapes, what that looks like. So like, all right, let's, let's start like kind of progressing into that. And the first rep, you could tell his ankle still wasn't ready to kind of handle even that velocity. And that was like, for me, I was like, all right, I'm an idiot. Like peel back. And, um, it took some trust from the kid too, because Basically, the doctor, I told him, you're allowed to run. You're allowed to do this, which is a big milestone, understandably. Um, and then, but I essentially didn't allow him to run for another four to six weeks because he lacked the requisite stiffness to run at a velocity high enough to have the shapes look similar to what he performs in football. Um, basically, I didn't want to allow him to ever be at a velocity that promotes heel striking. And so it was, we just basically a ton of speed power drills, more isometrics. I took a ton of like the Chris Corpus foot isometrics and he he's, hates those now because he's done it so much, but he, he's realized like the value and it's like, oh wow, I feel so like poppy. And like some of the languages used is like, all right, we're in a good spot. Um, but basically, um, yeah, that was probably the big one where I was like, okay, we're allowed to run. The end goal is, but the end goal is not running. It's not even fast running. It's sprinting, jumping, cutting at near maximal speeds. Um, so if that's the end goal, you know, oh, you start slower and work up faster. But in reality, slow running looks absolutely nothing like fast running and me and DeMarco were joking, this kind of turned into almost like a feed the cats rehabilitation. Um, but we, uh, a lot of it from like Holler and those guys, but it was, um, it was like, all right, so we kept building the stiffness through isometrics and speed power drills up until the point where he could run at a velocity fast enough to basically look like slightly slowed down sprint shapes um and i think that so the, the 
the first day that he quote unquote ran and the first day that he ran full speed, like no restrictions at all, was actually a pretty quick window. But the preparatory work up to that was much more specific to the end goal than just starting with slower running and working up. Um, and I think that was a, a very important divergence, um, not only because we got to the end goal faster than what is typical, um, but we um, just kept, honestly, I think it just kept a lot of noise out of the system. Like, okay, we can do this, we can do this, we can do X, Y, Z, but is it actually getting us towards our end goal? Um, and if the answer is no, like, I'm not going to include it because while it might, might not be inherently detrimental, he's only got so much energy. We've only got so much time. We've only, like, and so if it's not filling that end goal bucket, like, I'm not probably not going to include it. Um, cause he was also getting a lot of general training around it cause he was pretty much cleared from weight room perspective. So he was doing all of our normal season training. Um, but in terms of the high intensity, like the supplementary work that he was doing in lieu of him being able to practice um, that I handled, it was, um, yeah, I think pretty good in terms of like, we didn't just like, oh, we're going to do these drills because we have X amount of time and you're cleared to do it. It was, is this getting us close to full speed sprinting, jumping, cutting? If the answer was no, we didn't do it. Um, and part of that too was when it, what went into that was taken from you know some of Boo's principles that he talked about was we, I didn't change frequency really with him once we got into work that was high intense like a high enough intensity um, that it was like it's having a decent impact on his nervous system like the August even early September stuff was extensive enough that we were performing essentially almost every day. Um, but then once we started getting into a decently intensive stuff, we basically it was Tuesdays and Fridays. And it was like, hey, I'm feeling good. Even when we got to the point where it was, hey, I'm feeling good. Can we add in another day? It was like, no, I don't think that's going to be beneficial. Because um, we were able, on those Tuesdays and Fridays, we were able to keep the intensity super high. Um, and then, you know, and there were a couple of days where Wednesday or Saturday, it was like, hey, I'm, you know, a little sore in this spot, this spot. But it was nothing more nothing out out of the range of an athlete performed, you know, 200 yards of a lactic sprint work and they feel it a little bit the next day. So it's like, all right, like we're good to go. Um, so on those in between days we did, we just still kept up a fair amount of extensive volume and through, like, he just like, he likes jump roping. So I let him jump rope a fair amount and, um, kept up the foot isometrics, arch work. And then as we got into more intensive stuff, um, a lot of the long duration isometrics, um, just to kind of help with that, just put him in, um, environments to get some creep, uh, on the tendon. Um, but then we just basically, it was like, okay, from that four month spot was some sort of ground contact. Then really that September 1st was he's allowed to run. But I didn't, we didn't actually start running until October 1st um, because, like I said, we just worked up speed power drills, isometrics, because I didn't want to do any running that didn't look like sprinting at some capacity. Um, but then it ended up helping on the back end because the basically October 1st was the first day that we quote-unquote ran. And then November 1st was his first, November 1st was full speed sprinting, no restrictions, jumping, cutting, you know, I'd be out there with him in some open environments. Um, so we basically went four weeks from the introduction of any sort of running until it was full speed. Um, Cause, and it, Credit to the kid, it took some trust from him because doctors were telling him, you're allowed to do this. But it was, I was like, I still don't think it's valuable right now to get you towards the end goal. Um, like, trust me now, you're going to be sprinting earlier 
and feeling better earlier if we are pro smart about these progressions. Uh, so yeah, cut me off at any point if I start rambling. But uh, no, I, I love this because I think that you know it, what this does is it, it it makes you take a step back and look at not just the process, but how you reverse engineered the process and, and knowing where you wanted to go and knowing where these kind of, um, may, may you call them like railroad tracks that you were going to come up to and you were like, you're driving the bus and you got to stop no matter what to make sure you're checking some things and knowing that you're getting to these points. Um, I think that the one question that I would have, yeah, you know, going through you know, a guy that just, Knock wood, um, back playing post ACL. I mean, obviously, completely different operation injury and all that. Mm. Um, but my problem that I had with him is is similar to what you were saying. He was a kid that was always trying to, you know, what I'm good, we can go again. I'm good, we can go again. Um, what were some of the strategies that helped you communicate with this young man that really more isn't better? just better is better and you need those better days not more of them yeah um some of it was for me like these athletes at the end of the day like your basketball kid he cares about playing basketball this kid he plays about he cares about playing football so it was even if i understand so i understand the the difference between okay what what i want to get done on the field versus what we're allowed to do now and kind of that gap. And like you're saying, like, okay, oh, but I can do this. Let me do this. Um, or I want to do more. And, um, I really always kind of brought it back to as much football stuff as I could. I was like, Hey, you know, what is this end goal that you see? Like whether it was showing film of his favorite running back or even old film of him, like, Hey, we want to get you back to this. Like, do you think this stuff really help? Like, and like explaining even without getting too much into the science of, but like, he's also a smart kid. So he kind of understood some of the general principles um, of just being like, you got to trust me here because I truly believe that this is going to get us like to that end goal faster. Cause we like, almost like aligning those end goals where he's like, Hey coach, I can run. And I was like, Hey, but look at me. Do you really care about running? Like if I said, hey, hey, let's go run a mile, you'd say, Ugh, like, he's a super like twitched up kid. He would hate that. Um, so like, so let's get on the same verbiage. Like you, you want to sprint. So let me help you get there as fast as possible. Um, and some of it was, you know, even those first couple days after, you know, like I said, I had that aha, I'm an idiot moment where I was like, I watched him do a single rep and like five ground contacts in of that foot. I was like, I'm an idiot. Okay. Let's peel back to this, this, and this. Um, but I just made sure to like really explain it in terms of like, I'm not trying to hold you back in any sense. Like you may see it that way in terms of doctors cleared for X and we're not doing X. Um, but the end goal is still the end goal. And let me help you get to that end goal as fast as I see fit. Um, and there were definitely some good like milestones along the way that helped him kind of see, um, like, oh, wow, that feels good. Like when we, we got into, um, the plyometrics and that even like that feels bouncy and athletic and, you know, like those even more so than a, you know, kind of plodding along slow running. So when he was able to like, oh, I can like jump or even like he likes to jump rope. So it was like, hey, you know, this is pretty, we kept it pretty extensive. So it was like very early on, it was like, hey, man, we can jump rope. And it was like, awesome. Like finding little things along the way that mattered to him um, helped with that kind of psyche end of the spectrum of it. Um, but then even just, you know, and really make, for me, making a big deal out of those milestones. Like, hey, we can jump rope. Like, that's awesome. And then when we got into, quote, unquote, sprinting, even when it was slowed down a fair amount, you know, it was mostly speed power drills. Um, and it was all, like, soft starts. It was like, hey, you know, getting on the verbiage of, like, hey, we're sprinting now. Like, you're you're sprinting. 
that and he's like yeah i don't quite feel but then like we were smart about the intensities and the volumes in such a way that even while he was saying hey i can do more i can do more i want to do more the that was overridden by the fact that we kept the volumes and intensities at such a point where he felt better every single day that we performed some sort of work um you know apart from just like regular soreness um and just like hey you know like we did a fair amount of sprint work yesterday my you know whole kind of lower leg complex is feeling it a little bit and then we do some sort of work and he'd feel better um but i think just planning it and not to say there weren't little tiny setbacks along the way but just from a general overall you know slope he essentially felt better every single time that we performed high intensity work um, because the stiffness started started coming back just him organizing the skill of sprinting started coming back more and more because he hadn't done it in a while um so yeah and even like explaining in the terms of also like hey man if you hadn't even torn your Achilles, but I made you sit on your ass for five months, you would all you you'd look terrible today too. Like like you know. So it's like getting even getting that out of his head of like at this point, it's not even necessarily like your Achilles. It's just the fact that you haven't performed this skill in a while. So that'll start to come back, you know. And so every single day he sprinted, it felt better, it looked better. Um, partly because we were developing the stiffness in the shank, but also maybe even more so was he was just developing and getting better at that skill of um, sprinting, which he hadn't done in five months. So, yeah. How, how much then technical work did you have to do with this young man? Because I know that, I mean, obviously if you're talking with Nick, then the, the kind of the, the goal before the goal would have been some constraints led type activities. But now yeah. when you're looking at like building him back <laughs> literally from the ground up in this situation, yeah. Yeah, how yeah. much just like drilling was there needed for that, like to reteach him how to run and how to trust that foot when he had to plant it into the ground mm-hmm. um, and those sort of things. Yeah. So we, that, that's another area that I think, not jumping into the running when we were exactly cleared to do it helped us because I essentially had a month of speed power drills where I was able to, you know, and it helped. It was a one-on-one setting too. Um, so I was able to basically watch every single thing that he did. And um, it helped that he even beforehand was a very pretty runner. Um, so he already kind of understood he'd been doing that for, you know 18 plus years and so even with five months of inactivity it doesn't go away completely um but he um having that full month of just like speed power drills where we're working to develop the stiffness um it helped a lot and i also so i yeah i get what you're saying so we getting him back into the better shapes i think I come from kind of a, I would look at that as kind of like Dan Path, Boo, like from that aspect. It was like, if we're not, if, if whatever, he's not getting in a good hip lock position. Why is that happening? You know, and I, I always go back to posture and ground forces. Um, and so it's like, you know, kind of some third law of motion type stuff where are we, are we seeing a deficit in the reaction? or a deficit in the action. Um, so, okay, he's not getting into good front side mechanics where it's like, okay, I could have spent time drilling that. In reality, it was because he's not putting as much force into the ground because we're still coming along in terms of developing stiffness in that ankle. So he's not putting as much force in the ground. He's not going to have as high reaction force, and so his knee isn't getting as high. So it was like also not worrying about if I, I was, I knew if I kept drilling and drilling and drilling, the actions, like then the reactions that we often see manifested as like pretty running, would take care of itself. Um, and we saw that a fair amount, where as stiffness in the shank went up, shapes got better, um, and you know just from a postural and like specific strength aspect in terms of 
you know, front side core, hip flexors that hadn't been worked in that manner a lot. Um, we were getting a lot of that kind of specific work with the speed power drills themselves. Um, so they kind of led into each other. Uh, so I guess that would be another kind of principle, um, kind of even talking through now that I realized, like I didn't, and I take this even with a healthy individual, uh, if I'm, if we're doing speed power work is not, if the, if a reaction to forces is not looking the way I want it to, um, or yeah, not what is considered acceptable or kind of within a certain bandwidth. I don't, I always go back to, okay, well, what is the action that is preceding that reaction from ground forces? And there's probably a deficit there, or we're not in a good posture to handle the reaction forces. Um, and so could basically always boiling it, boiling it back down to ground reaction or sorry, ground forces, force production, and then the posture. And if we get those two in line, things kind of, everything else kind of falls in line apart from, you know, if you have the requisite kind of suppleness um, elsewhere. Um, and so I just tried to just stay true to those principles, even with um, the rehabilitation. Like, yeah, he didn't have great frontside work early. It didn't look pretty frontside, but it was like, okay, I'm not going to kind of, I'm not going to worry about that too much because as the stiffness came back in the shank, um, the, those sorts of reaction type movements took care of themselves. I like that because I think that, you know, especially the idea of how people like to really pinpoint and over classify specifics that they see in movement instead of stepping back and looking at it and that action reaction. I think that that's, that's pretty big time and something that a lot of people can do better with. Yeah. And that was a big aha moment for me as well, where it was. And, um, part of that spurred from that lunch I had with boo, um, where I was like 23 years old, 24 years old. And, um, I was lucky then at Nichols, I was, ba I basically programmed everything that happened outside of the weight room. Um, and all our speed power work that happened on the field. Um, and Boo had come into the, our lunch and had looked up everything we did on Twitter. And he basically came in with like, I like this that you do. I like this that you do. I don't like this. I don't like it. And it was like, I was sitting there like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, but one of the things is, he laid out his argument of why he can't stand wickets. Um, and while I, you know, and I completely see it, he's like, you're training a reaction when the issue is actually the action. And he kind of laid out his argument for that. Um, now specifically still can include some wickets for some context and uh, that sort of thing. I'm not as extreme on it as he is, but the underlying principle of like, at the end of the day, these, you know, stop if you're trying to cue something or cue an athlete into something that is a reaction to something else if you're changing the reaction without changing the action you're just going to get frustrated um or you're going to be in prettier shapes but run slower because if i'm housing down the field focusing on pulling my knees up i could if i took a slow-mo and followed you all the way down the field it could look pretty as hell and then you're not putting any force in the ground and you're not going anywhere um so he's like, really boil it down to what is, you know, like kind of the basal constituents of what gets us faster or what makes us jump higher or what helps us change direction. Um, yeah, I guess that could even lead into sort of change of direction stuff um, with this Achilles specifically too, where we, um, I look at change of direction similar to how, um, some track coaches do where it's basically like the, you know, the ability to like putting in an open, obviously the end goal is on the field, open environments. You know, I took a ton from Mishka and Swifle and those guys on that. Um, but then purely looking at the um, physical aspect of that. Um, it's like, okay, we need to be able to 
handle you know, yielding forces and just the physical aspect of change of direction looks a lot like multi-directional plow metrics. Um, and so we, um, you know, what goes into that stiffness, you know, in all rain, in all planes, I mean, like if I'm just doing straight ahead hurdle jumps, then it's probably not helping me a ton if I need to 90 degree plane and go. But if you're including all sorts of multi-directional plow metrics along with just good solid linear work, um, that level of stiffness translates. Um, and that's kind of a, another Derek Hansen influence um, where it's, you know, we talk about max velocity transferring down basically like a top down speed reserve type of thing, but then also breaking it down even more to look at, um, you know, ground contact, faster ground contacts translate to slower ground contacts basically up until an external force is introduced, but not the other way. Um, and so the, the obviously there's, a, there's an end to that, you know, a lineman with a ground contact where he's pushing on another 300 pound person, that's, you know, that's the point where the external force is introduced. Um, but if I can, you know, if I'm max V at 0.08 ground contacts, and then I have to do a 90 degree cut that's at or 0.35 or something like that. That translates down. It doesn't translate the other way. Um, and there are other other aspects of the physical part of change in direction, where it's just like general eccentric lower body strength and you know the ability to organize yourself in different planes, which can come from also come from those kind of plyometrics and then just general strength work. Um, but I didn't. I didn't start with closed work with this Achilles before getting into open environments. I just limited the distances and kind of area available to him in the open environments. Um, and that was preceded by a lot of, not necessarily a lot, but the that was preceded by getting up to very high intensity, essentially full intensity multi-directional plow metrics. Um, and I think, so we basically didn't perform any non-linear field work until he could perform linear field work full speed and had the requisite stiffness to do that without any sort of aberration. Um, and so that stiffness then translated over very quickly because uh, he was still performing the multi-directional plow metrics general strength work, you know, in kind of all planes and our just um, normal uh, weight room sessions. Um, but he, you could, he still had like the, he's a running, he, he was a skill player, so he wanted to get into like the, you know, dancing and all that. And I was like, just trust me, like, it's not going to look pretty if you started doing that right now. But if we, I'm building the qualities to then help you do this. Like even with the plyometrics, it was like, you know, whether just like a straight, uh, you know, frontal plane skater hop, and I was like videoing it and then showing him like, hey, doesn't that kind of look like a cut? And he'd be like, oh, okay, like so it was kind of like putting those boxes together. It was like, coach, I want to like cut and all this. I was like, look, you are. Like it doesn't. Yes, it's different, but we're building, we're building that high velocity eccentric strength that we want in all planes that then carries over to when we add the stimulus of the open environment. And it was basically me acting as tackle or linebacker. Um, we started in really small environments and then built up a little bigger um, to the point where basically he could, um, you know, then they, that was a good point as well. Cause then they kind of looked like running back drills. And so it was like a good, um, another milestone for him from a psychological standpoint where, you know, you know, and he got to feel good, you know, trying to shake me and all that. Uh, but it was um, another point where it was, hey, we can, you know, like with the running where it was, hey, we can run. I said, okay, but we're not going to yet. There was also the, hey, we're allowed to cut. I said, okay, yes, we are allowed to do that. But even though we're not necessarily doing that right now, explaining to him and showing him how the um, 
the support of work we were doing was leading up to that um, with the multidirectional plow metrics and how that that stiffness traveled down the ladder um, and it reaped benefits on the back end when the first time he was in an open environment and it was like a three yard by three yard box like I could have tagged him without him doing any sort of shake or anything but it was um, that stiffness carried over because he just felt like he had that kind of pop and you know just felt good and even then explaining it like you could see some hesitancy early on but then even explaining him like you know look at this like remember those jumps we did last week this looks so simple like, you've already done this you're not staring at my ugly mug trying to tag you but you've already done this and he, and then he was just like putting those together of like oh yeah like, i've already done this like i've already been in situations where either the force was higher or the velocity was higher within the game um and so like when you put it together kind of in that middle zone where uh, the ground contacts were slower than what he's already incurred he was able to just kind of go um, so yeah well i'm just happy that you let the guy win once or twice you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> former uh former college receiver here i not uh known for tackling skills by any means but um but yeah it was it it's it's gone really well um and probably even better for me as a coach has been kind of the debriefing i'm like all right um like okay i know i didn't include any sort of change of direction that looked like change of direction it was like really breaking it down like why did i do that and then realizing like okay performing that like the end goal was still developing the stiffness to high, like to full speed sprint chop cut. Is doing some sort of box cone drill gonna help us get there? And ultimately decided, is it gonna help us get there more than some higher intensity multi-directional plot metrics? And decided no. And so I didn't include it. It wasn't just like, oh, we can do this. We're gonna do the plot metrics as well. And then just to keep them happy, we're going to do these as well, because that's just noise in the system that we don't need. And while on the surface, it might look like it's not, it might look like it's not hurting the process. Um, it just over months and months and months is just adding unneeded noise to the system that overall could hinder the process towards the end goal, which was stiffness. I love it, man. Well, Joel, let me get you out of here with this, brother. Where can people find out more about what you're doing? Where can they, you know, contact you, see what's going on with all that? Yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter, I think I'm just at Joel Reinhardt. Instagram, I think it's Joel H. Reinhardt. Um, then my um, email is jreinhardt at umass.edu. Um, and then, yeah, just hit me up on any of those, and I can – let you know more about uh, some of my thought processes or I think I went through it decently extensively now but even now as I'm talking through it I'm hearing myself and going oh I didn't think of that a little differently and so I'm, I have a word document next to the Skype thing that's I'm taking notes as well because it's like okay I thought about that um, yeah because I found for me like I either writing through things or talking through things I always end up realizing it getting a better understanding of it. Um, so that's one of the reasons I, I love doing stuff like this is it, it usually helps me more than anything. I'm uh, just getting to talk through my own ideas. So uh, yeah, but reach out to me on any of those um, and I will more than happy to either let you know more about what I've been doing or if you have ideas about how to improve on that or whatever. Uh, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one of my good mentors who's helped me a ton with this is his name's Arno Reinberger. He's the director of rehabilitation uh, with Minnesota football, and I've leaned on him a lot. Um, and a lot of my principles are taken from, I mentioned Boo a lot, but a lot of my principles are from Arno as well, because um, he's doing, doing it, does a great job of bridging the gap between kind of performance or looking at rehabilitation simply as performance because at the end of the day we look at performance you start with rehab you start with performance it's 
getting towards an end goal, which is full, no restriction sport activity. Uh, so we're starting with that and working back. And I was with him, interned with him both at Western Michigan and Minnesota under Flagstaff and um, getting exposed to him and now still reaching out and leaning on him for some specifics of, you know, hey, I've got all these principles. I've done them with hamstrings and a little bit with ACLs, but I've never done an Achilles before. What are some things that I'm missing? And just like those sort of things. So um, shout out to Arnold for helping me out with that. So. I dig it, man. I truly appreciate your time, Joel. This is sensational stuff. People are going to love it. All right. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Truly grateful for your time, brother. And we'll be in touch real soon. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you. And a huge thanks to UMass's Joel Reinhardt for spending the time with us today. Guys, just some open, honest, candid sharing from a coach who's really sitting there and just laying it all out for us. This is what we did. This is what we saw that worked. These are the processes, the step-by-step -step way we went through it. These were the principles guiding our direction. This is absolutely killer stuff. So many nuggets, so much great stuff. I think this is a talk that people are going to need to listen to over and over so that we can better identify some places that we can do better when it comes to our return to play protocol with our athletes. So Joel, keep up the great work, brother. This is fantastic stuff. I can't thank you enough for being so open, honest, and candid in your sharing with us today. This is great. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we're just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.